worship here at Horizon Fellowship. It is good to see you on this rainy, praise the Lord, Sunday morning. Uh, on our second Sunday of Advent, as we inch closer to Christmas, it is always good to come together and worship. If you are a guest with us today, I invite you to fill out one of our cards, let us know that you are here, how we might get in touch with you, and how we might minister in your life. So again, welcome, and may we worship the Lord. Today is the deadline for the North Georgia Fruiser Christmas Tree Builder. If you would like to make a monetary donation uh, to that cause, today is the deadline to do that. So if you're planning on doing that, make sure you do that before you leave here today. Also, on Friday, December 9th, beginning at 9 p.m. at our Walmart in Beaver Town, the youth are planning on helping the shop, but they can always use adults as well. So if you would like to participate in a more hands-on way, make plans to be there uh, for that on uh, December 9th. Today, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, is our church-wide Christmas dinner. Everyone's invited. I hope to see everybody back out this afternoon and evening as we enjoy fun, fellowship, and sports and food together. Uh, also coming up on Saturday, December 10th, is a youth Someone to keep your children while you do Christmas shopping or just go hide somewhere for a few hours. Um, that will be available from 4 to 8. Uh, you can find the details in the bulletin. Uh, but I do hope that you will tell your friends and uh, speak to them a bit about that opportunity as well. And last, but definitely not least, coming up on Friday and Saturday, December 16th and 17th at 7 each night, our uh, presentation of Holding Hands and Christmas will be held, and I hope that you're already inviting your neighbors and friends and family to attend, one or both of those. 
Kind of how it works in the south, isn't it? Company's coming. We got to clean this house. My mom is a very good housekeeper, and our house always looked great to me. But I can still remember how she would act if company was coming. She brought out the broom, the mop, the sponges, the window cleaner, the furniture cleaner, cleaners for things I didn't even know needed to be cleaned. And she would give me a, a list, and she would put me to work. And then when we were finished, she would still find things that weren't clean. But can you imagine what it would have been like around our house if we'd have been expecting somebody really important, you know, like a king or a queen or something? Well, that's what our Bible lesson is about this morning, the coming of a king. And not just any king, but the king of kings, Jesus. Good. I'm going to read to you just a couple of verses of scripture from Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. The Bible tells us that in the days before Jesus came, John the Baptist and his ministry in a lot of ways was telling people to clean up that Jesus was coming. He was preaching and telling them that they needed to be ready when Jesus came. And he didn't mean that they needed to go home and dust and mop and pick up their toys and their dirty clothes and, and all that stuff, but he meant that they needed to look at their lives and Turn toward God. And when they did this, John would baptize them in the Jordan River. That's how he got the name John the Baptist. And baptism is it's a symbol that says that God has come into our life and we've cleaned up our lives with the help of God. And it's important for us to be ready for the coming of the King too. And as we celebrate Advent and Christmas, we celebrate Jesus coming into the world. But it's a great time for us to think about, have we decided that we want to follow Jesus and allow God to clean us up? And if we do that, the Bible tells us that God will help us and that we will be ready for Jesus. Can you pray with me? God, every day we do things for which we need your forgiveness. Lord, we need you to help us get cleaned up and be uh, ready for you. So this time of year as we prepare to celebrate you coming into the world, Lord, help us also in our lives to be prepared to live for you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing the second stanza of hymn number 82, Light the Light, the Fire of Life.
Good morning on this second Sunday of Advent, which represents preparation and peace. Our scripture this morning comes from the 40th chapter of Isaiah, verse 3 through 5. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Today, we relight the candle of expectation and hope. Let this candle remind us of the great hope we have in Christ the Messiah and in God's promises. As we light the candle of preparation and peace, let it remind us to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. May we pray. Father, guide us in confession of our sins. We know that in the greatness of your love, you've promised to forgive us. We know that in limiting your forgiveness limits your grace. Cleanse us as we prepare our lives for the coming of Jesus again. This we ask in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. Our next hymn is hymn number 79. Let's stand as we sing all stanzas of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
May we pray. We come to you now, Heavenly Father, our Lord, the one who has given us so much peace and so many blessings and so much hope. We have homes to give us shelter and clothes to keep us warm and food to nourish our bodies. You've given us the much-needed rain this week for which we are so thankful. You've given us hands and hearts to touch lives and to be a blessing to others, even to those we do not know. We now lift up to you this offering, Lord. May it be blessed and multiplied and put to good use here in our community and across the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand for our doxology.
Our Old Testament passage of Scripture this morning comes from Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Our New Testament reading comes from Romans 15, verses 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. And in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again he says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise Him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In Him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.
In my personality, I have a lot of quirks, as my wife likes to remind me, but one of those is that I've always been fascinated by billboards. I read pretty much every one of them that I see, and I like to watch for the funny ones, the creative ones, the ones that really get your attention. And there have been a few over the years that have interested me enough that I've actually taken the time to try and find the history of the billboards. And one such example is this little, well, it's not all that little, but it's a tourist trap in Dillon, South Carolina. And it's got a little bit of everything. It's the only place in the world I know where you can find fireworks, a snake zoo, amusement rides, a taco stand, a motel, a wedding chapel, a 300-foot observation tower with a giant sombrero on the top, (laughs) and be welcomed by a 103-foot tall stereotypical Mexican fella named Pedro. But the most unique thing about south of the border in Pedro is that you can find him on over 250 billboards from New Jersey to Florida along I-95. At their most frequent as you get close to south in the bo- south of the border and North Carolina from the north and South Carolina from the south, they average one every three miles. The man who came up with the campaign said that when I-95 was built, he saw the potential to turn his roadside stand, which catered mostly to those just across the border in North Carolina, selling things that were illegal in the next county over in NC, namely booze and fireworks, into a major destination. His secret? Anticipation. His idea was that the signs on the interstate would have every driver from the north in the south, wanting to see what the south of the border was all about. And it worked. Today, the place is a little run, well, a lot run down, actually. But you drive by it, and it's still full of cars. People see those signs, and they just can't help it. That when they get to that exit, they say, we've got to see Pedro. (laughs) Closer to home, we're all familiar most likely with another creative billboard campaign to see Rock City. In the days before the interstate, Rock City owner Garnet Carter needed to get the word out about his brainchild of Rock City Gardens. But without an interstate system or billboards, how would he advertise? His solution, barns. Barns were everywhere along the backcountry roads of rural America. And the depression-weary Americans in 1935 were just starting to regain their love for the automobile and to take to the roads again. At the same time, many farmers had suffered greatly during the Depression and their barns were in a state of disrepair. Carter's idea, hire an artist named Clark Byers to paint the barns for the farmers for free in exchange for using them as billboards and a few free tickets to Rock City. It worked. Soon, see Rock City and related slogans were painted on barns throughout the South and beyond. At its peak, there were over nine hundred barns painted and it entered the American folklore lexicon. There aren't many left today, but spotting one of those ever recognizable barns is not only a view of an historic landmark, but it reminds us of a simpler time when motorists would drive through the country in search of family fun. Bet you didn't think when you got up to come to church this morning you were going to learn some weird history, did you? <laughs> but what do these billboard campaigns have in common and what in the world do they have to do with Advent? Well, first and foremost, they worked. They were very 
and continue to be very successful ad campaigns. And they worked in the same way. They built curiosity and anticipation. They got the person reading the signs to think, I want to see Rock City. I want to know what Rock City is all about. Or I need to stop at south of the border. I need some fireworks and a taco. I don't know. But people stop. And what that tells me is that we probably underestimate both the power of signs to persuade us as well as the power of signs to inform us. Where would we be without signs? Signs on the highway tell us road names and directions. Billboards serve to let us know where we might find a bite to eat or a tourist attraction or place to stay, a good campaign might even entertain us or remind us to eat more chicken. We have signs that inform us on how to drive, they tell us to stop, they give us a suggested speed which we should go, they warn us of dangers up ahead. They help us find a potty when our three-year-old is screaming at the top of his lungs that he needs a potty and he needs it now. (laughs) Life is full of signs which guide us, direct us, and lead us to where we need to go. The Advent journey, like life, is full of signs. Signs which build anticipation, signs which inform Signs which guide and direct us. And when we look at these texts that we've read today, we see these signs which help us navigate our Advent journey. And we see Advent come to life. Our first sign comes from Isaiah, and it's nothing more than a mere stump. And as I read that text, I can't help but think that maybe Isaiah was southern. Because only in the south would we give directions involving a stump. Look for the big stump. That's where you need to go. But Isaiah's stump is something special. It's the stump of a family tree. The family tree of the Davidic dynasty. It's been cut down. The kingdom of God's people is split in two. And the northern kingdom of Israel is in the midst of deep, dangerous tensions with Assyria. And they call upon their southern neighbors in Judah to help them. But the southern kingdom, afraid to get involved in the conflict, instead sends a delegate to Assyria and says, you've got our neighbors to the north really nervous. Can you all work out your differences? But what happens is it backfires and Assyria works out those differences by invading and destroying the northern kingdom and then setting their sights on the southern. The Davidic line with the fall of the kingdom is reduced to a mere stump. The family tree is cut down. It seems on the surface that God's promise and blessing and covenant with His people has come to an end. But yet from this stump, in the middle of this destruction and this dismay, Isaiah sees a sign. A new shoot is coming up from this stump. A sign that the tree is still alive. And the Messiah will come from David's line. And this Messiah will be the Prince of Peace. The one who will come and bring justice and equality to the world. The Messiah who would end conflict and usher in a new age. The sign pointed towards something great. It raised the anticipation of God's people, that the Messiah would soon come. 
That same sign points us year after year during Advent back to the Messiah, Jesus. The sign calls us to take our eyes off the ones our world may have crowned as our prince or our king. To step back from those that we might elect to put all of our faith in and choose to be our golden calf and instead refocus on Jesus. The sign of the cut down stump with one branch coming from it points us back to the new life found in Jesus Christ. And as the signs point us to hope in the Prince of Peace, the signs instruct us on how we are to be living today. As Paul connects the signs of Isaiah with the life of Christ, The passage introduces us to an incarnational theology. As Christ came in the major, it was God incarnated in human flesh. In the church age, we, the church, are the incarnation of Christ to the world. We are God's continued presence in our world. And we are given directional signs in the life of Jesus for how we are to be that presence. Those signs, they shape us, they mold us, they tell us the way in which we should go to live our life in the present. My family had the chance to go up to the Smokies this past Friday and Saturday, and we went to Dollywood. And pray for those folks up there, just as an aside. You're not just a pastor when you're at church, and apparently I put off that that vibe, which is well and good, but I got to hear so many people's stories. There's so many hurting people. So keep them in, in your prayers, but... It had been a long time since I'd been to Dollywood, eight or nine years, something like that. Katie and I went not long after we got married, and we hadn't been back since. But the place had changed so much, I couldn't find my way around. Thankfully, they've got signs everywhere telling you which way to go. And as I wandered around looking for the signs, trying to figure out where I needed to be, it made me think that in life, that's often the case. Life changes. Things are different. What we experience next year or even tomorrow may be very different from what we experience today. But I was reminded that in Christ, we have the signs that regardless of how much changes in our life, we can always be pointed in the right direction. We are told in this passage that God's promises are still very much in effect. That God's love for us has not changed. And that the signs all point back to the Prince of Peace if we will follow them. The signs all point back to one key truth. Love one another. In a world where so much of what we see and hear tells us to hate each other, to despise those who are different than ourselves, to fear the stranger. It would do us all good 
to go back and read the signs that Jesus left us along the way in His life and ministry. When we do that, we discover that not only did Jesus love unconditionally, but He made it beyond clear that those of us who will follow Him take that calling and responsibility upon ourselves. We must read and heed those signs. For the prophecy of Isaiah is one step closer to reality when we live at peace with one another. But ultimately, the signs point to the final destination. The anticipation is built. The end of the journey is peace. Peace among all of God's creation. We are reminded that there will be a new day when all of the world will coexist not only with God but with one another. Eventually even nature and humanity will coexist together. The images of that coming day are absolutely beautiful. Prey lying down with predator. There's been a lot of incredible artwork over the years depicting this moment. But to me, the most compelling thing are videos on the internet. You can go on YouTube and search for odd animal friendships. And you will get a ton of videos that are equally cute and fascinating. I saw one just this past week that was covered on the news of this friendship between a pack of sled dogs and a polar bear. You know what most polar bears would do to a dog? But this polar bear, every year when it comes in close to this town in the Arctic Circle, doesn't come in and cause destruction. But it comes in and finds these dogs and lays down and rolls around in the snow and lets these dogs play with it. And they are the best of friends. And the photographer that caught this was just amazed because that's not natural behavior. It's pretty amazing. And to me, stories like that are just more signs that God's creation is more capable of peace than we give it credit for. But the prophecy of Isaiah points to the day when enemies no longer exist. A stark contrast to our world as we know it. A world where we, human beings, are our own worst enemy. A world in which we are the world's worst predators. Destroying each other along with our creation that God has given us to live in. Constantly fighting and living lives surrounded by violence. Destroying our earth in pursuit of our own gains. But the day will come when we will lay down our own acclamation to violence and destruction and find peace. And there's hope in that. The sign which points to that peace, remember, is a mere stump. Something that once had been cut down and seemingly of little use, and yet out of it comes life. As we look at our world with despair, seeing the pain, tragedy, violence, the signs remind us that even out of that, 
brokenness, God is still bringing new life. So then the call for us is to embrace that new life, to live it out both individually and collectively, to play our part into God's advent into the world, and to know that the realm of God shines into the world through the mission and work of us. I firmly believe that Christians are God's sign in the 21st century that God is not done. The challenge is not to be hung up by the ways of the world and its thinking and doing, but to embrace what God has shown us. So as we continue on our Advent journey and the journey of life, Where are the signs leading you? What anticipation is growing in your heart? What are you being directed to do? What are we being asked to do? If we follow the signs, our Advent journey will be one more step toward the breaking through of God and our world becoming a reality. Amen. Please stand for our hymn of invitation. Number 165 stands as one and four. for our benediction in unison, our Advent prayer for today. Father, guide us in confession of our sins. We know that in the greatness of your love, you have promised to forgive us. Cleanse us as we prepare our lives for the coming of Jesus again. This we ask in his name. Amen.